Okay, last week of the course, I wanted to spend this week talking about water resources management. I've trimmed down this section to essentially one lecture and one video, and it's sort of a grab bag of miscellaneous topics within water resources management that I feel are um, relevant to our current situation in the West. Water resources management is a massive topic that um, I've taken an entire course on. Um, and if you're interested in it, there's tons of good reading out there. But I'm just going to touch on a bunch of random topics that together I think make up um, a body of, of knowledge and, and issues that represents water resources management today. Okay, so some of those are going to include watershed management, water law, climate change, groundwater use and management, and something called conjunctive use, which kind of goes with that topic of groundwater use. So watershed basin management. So our water, our, when we think about the hydrologic cycle and our little hydrology box diagram, it all starts with precipitation. And so if we're going to manage our water resources, it starts by saying, let's manage our watershed where our rainfall falls so uh, to maximize both quantity and quality. So that is our goal. We want to reduce erosion. Um, erosion is problematic for a number of reasons. One is that it washes away the most fertile soil, which is usually the topsoil, the top layer of soil, but also because it can reshape landscapes, it can um, uh, cause instability in foundations and things like that. Uh, we want to improve flood protection. So if we can slow down water, uh, as we've talked about with our surface water, water runoff section, if we can slow the water down, if we can enhance infiltration, we'll reduce potential flooding that could happen downstream. If you think about Hurricane Harvey and its impact on Houston and how much flooding there was there, that's an issue of where that watershed has not been properly managed. And so now when we have a large rainfall event like that, um, we don't have very good flood protection because there's very little place for water to infiltrate, for it to slow down, and so we get this flooding issues. Uh, we want to, again, increase infiltration, enhance groundwater recharge. We want to, especially in places like the arid west where we have like a wet season and a dry season, during the wet season we have more water than we need, than we want, and so the, the issue is usually drainage and flood protection. In the dry season, we don't have enough water. We don't have the water we need. And so if we can increase infiltration, slow the water down, enhance that groundwater recharge in the wet season, then we have that reservoir of groundwater to draw upon during the dry season. Same with if we did surface water storage behind a dam, for example. Um, we also want to control sources of pollution. So we don't want, uh, you know, mines and other kind of... Um, industrial facilities that could be polluting either the surface or the groundwater within that watershed so that um, runoff or, or, or groundwater that runs through it picks up those contaminants, right? So some examples, um, like in the developing world where there's maybe been a lot of deforestation, it's also happened in the U.S. in places, um, that deforestation might be because they're harvesting trees for fuel, for, uh, for cooking, or for heating or to make uh, land for agriculture. But when you take those trees out, you're going to, those trees have a really important role of catching, slowing down uh, precipitation, using some of it, um, storing some of it so that it, it slows down that runoff potential. And when you cut all the trees down, the runoff potential is very high and you get that erosion issue you get um, very little infiltration down to groundwater. And um, so reforestation might be an example of like a watershed planning issue where you're trying to do that both to enhance quality, filtration through the, for, for, through the roots and through the forest, as well as slowing it down so that we have less flood control problems, we have more groundwater infiltration, storing the water for later, those kinds of things. Um, land use planning, so density of population, um, siting of various things, right? We wouldn't want to site like maybe a gas station right next to a big drinking water supply well if we know that 
potentially there'd be spills and leakage of gasoline at the gas station. We don't want it to put it within like what we'd call the wellhead protection area of the well. Um, so things like that. Uh, there's also regulations on like where can we have like a cemetery. We don't want to put that upstream, <laughs> up gradient of a well. Um, and then uh, stormwater technologies, we've mentioned low impact development techniques, infiltration basins, uh, bioswales, uh, green roofs, those kinds of things. Um, I put Peru on here when I was down in Peru a few years ago in the neighborhood. Uh, it was a very interesting situation where most of the houses had had thatched roofs. And um, that the government came in and paid for everybody to get a metal roof which was an improvement in the quality of life for people because they didn't have leakage through their roof anymore. Um, and so this was a really good thing. The problem is all of a sudden when it rained, the rain all hit those metal roofs, all ran off into this dirt unpaved road at the same time. And immediately from the time those roofs got replaced, um, they started having massive rutting and erosion of the, the roadway that goes between the houses to the point where um, not only was it very difficult to traverse that area, but it was also starting to undermine the foundations of some of these houses. Um, and you could see then a deterioration of the water quality where that water all ran off into. It used to be sort of like a place where people would swim um, and gather, but uh, now it was kind of like a really cruddy, silted up area that had a lot of the road material, the dirt in there. Um, and so the solution isn't necessarily to go back to the thatched roofs, but one thing you could do is if you put on rainwater harvesting for all of those um, houses, then you could capture some of that rainwater, prevent it from running off the road, um, and also use it during uh, drier periods as well. So that's the kind of thing when we're talking about watershed or basin management that we're talking about. So. Uh, water law is a um, very complex issue uh, and topic, but some basics uh, that I think help people understand what goes on with water law. Uh, just in laws in general, there's sort of three kind, two kinds of main laws. There's legislative laws like, where like a, legislate, a legislator will write a law, and um, within that we have two kinds, laws enacted by like the federal government, like the Clean Water Act, and then administrative law, which are regulations that are written in order to um, enforce those big acts. They might be written by staffers at a, at a regulatory agency at the EPA, for example. And then you've got, also got this other kind of law, which is common law or case law. And this is established by court rulings. So when judges interpret laws, sometimes they set precedent that become law that isn't specified within the actual legal laws that are on the books. And water law is really dominated by this common law or case law, so it becomes very um, institutionalized, the knowledge of what, um, you know, who has the rights to water in different situations. This uh, little diagram down here just is a little cartoon I found online that shows some um, things that could go on with it, but I think the next um, slide um, is more helpful that basically we have two kinds of water law, one that in the Eastern US that we call the riparian doctrine. And the riparian doctrine says, if you live next to a water body, you have rights to that water body. So I buy a property that's on a stream, I can use some of the water in the stream because I live on that stream, like my properties on it. Now that use has to be reasonable, but in the eastern U.S. where it rains pre pretty much throughout the year and a lot of the water that gets taken out um, winds up returning to those same systems, uh, you don't have uh, a lot of problems with that kind of a doctrine in the eastern U.S. In the western U.S. we have a totally different set of, of rules, which we call the prior appropriation doctrine and the prior appropriation doctrine says it has nothing in it about like hey i move next to this stream i have rights to the water in that stream the the, the water rights do not transfer with property rights like they do in the riparian doctrine in the western u.s we say the first person who staked a claim on the water owns those rights 
So the first person to apply for rights from the state and to be granted those has those rights, and as long as they continue using them and putting them to beneficial use, they maintain those rights. Um, and so you can see an example on the right where um, in 1910, this guy down here gets the water right um, and has the senior use. Up here, this person moves in later and wants a water right, <clears throat> but they're, they got theirs later, um, and, and they're further upstream. So in the riparian doctrine, in the eastern U.S., they'd be able to use their water. It might get returned, and this person down here could get theirs. But in prior appropriation doctrine, when, when we get to really low flows where there's not much water in the river, this person up here cannot use the water. Um, because this person has senior rights and that water has to be there for them. If this person uses enough that it infringes on the 1910 rights, that's illegal. So um, this gets very, very complicated, especially more complicated in that it tends to be the case that in many years there are more water rights that the volume of water that is granted via water rights, like in California, for example, is higher than the actual amount of water there is available. Um, and that's because during very wet years, everyone can get all their water. But in many years, there's not enough water for everyone who has rights to it to get it. And so we go back and say, okay, whoever had first, whoever had those first rights, get some. And some of these rights go back to 1910 or even into the 1800s to the gold rush era, as long as those rights have been continually used and maintained since that time. Um, related to groundwater, we have two different kinds of rules. One is the English rule and the other is the American rule. The English rule says, if I have a well, I overlay groundwater, I can pump whatever I want, basically. It doesn't matter if it harms you. The American rule says, I can pump as much as I want, but it, it has to uh, be reasonable, so I have to be like using the water. I can't just let it run everywhere and do nothing with it. Um, and second is I can't be harming an adjacent landowner. So you can see this example on the right hand side where if this well pumps enough, the water table gets drawn down to the point where this well goes dry or to where this poor salmon um, doesn't make it. So this wouldn't be allowed in American rule. It could be allowed in English rule depending on um, the situation. So again, this can get very complicated in areas where there are lots of wells, where they were drilled at different times, different depths, um, and even tracking how much water is in, in the subsurface. All of this can get quite complex. Some of the complexity is related to what happens downstream, what elements of the water cycle are you impacting. If you think about um, rainwater harvesting, this is a, a kind of a flashpoint issue for a lot of people in the West. It becomes a political issue where people think it's crazy that the, the states would regulate my own use of rainwater that falls on my property. But I think, you know, it's a useful question to think through. I own a house. Do I own the rain that falls on my roof? Do I own the rain that falls on my land or driveway? Um, and, you know, a lot of people believe that rainwater harvesting is illegal in Oregon or in other parts of the West. Um, this is... A common piece of misinformation that's spread around online to get people all riled up. That's not true. Um, rainwater harvesting by a residential user like myself is allowed as long as it's from my roof. Um, I can't do it from my entire land. I can't do it from like my driveway. And this makes some sense in that if everybody harvested all the water from their land, i.e. everyone made some sort of big dam on their property in a huge pond to save all that water, um, we would certainly be impacting the watershed, our, our ecology, our water supply, things like that. Um, but it's useful to think about, I mean, if I harvest the rainwater that falls on my roof and I store it and I use it for watering my, my crops, that a lot of that water gets evapotranspired or remains on the property, doesn't wind up going downstream, versus if I allow it to run off and go downstream, um, it's available to someone further downstream. And so if that person had had a prior right to that water, i.e. via the prior appropriation doctrine, some industry, for example, a paper mill or something, um, you know, me as an individual, this small amount of water might not make an impact, but if the whole community or city did it, 
it could have an impact depending on the waterway to where that now that person doesn't have enough water uh, to do their industry to do to do what they wanted to do with the water so it is interesting to think about how these different things can affect the water cycle and where something that might be environmentally friendly or might be beneficial to me could impact somebody else downstream um, and when you get into these water law issues riparian doctrine versus prior appropriation doctrine and how they come together on an issue like rainwater harvesting it becomes very complicated and, and interesting and, and most people don't understand the issue enough to to have a kind of a intelligent conversation about those pros and cons of something like that but um, I just think that's a, a good example of where you can put these ideas of the water cycle and water law together to say what is reasonable as a homeowner for you to do versus what's not reasonable. Um, okay, so another water resources management issue is climate change. Um, this is affecting water resources throughout the West in a big way. We know there's going to be increasing temperatures. This can uh, massively affect uh, the amount of water that we have stored in snow. Uh, for that <clears throat> typically our snow melt would occur in May, June, July in Oregon at upper elevations. And if that water falls as rain instead of as snow, it's going to run off a lot sooner, um, probably during a time when we don't need that water as much. Um, versus if it falls as snow, we have it in that like storage reservoir, that free storage until we need it more like towards the summer. Um, so that's a big deal. And then we might have increasing precipitation because we've increased evapotranspiration when the when the temperature is higher and that therefore is according to the water cycle if we have more evapotranspiration we have more precipitation but um, we can also store more water in the air since the, the there's higher temperatures so there's a higher vapor pressure um, as well as the fact that we have increasing evapotranspiration which means our demand for irrigation is higher um, and so when that precipitation falls and where it falls uh, is really important. Um, and this again kind of comes down to effects on runoff and infiltration and timing. This is probably the biggest impact of climate change is that we'll have higher runoff vo volumes sooner um, because it's not being stored as snow. We'll have these um, more extreme wet weather events in the wet season when we don't need that water and also more extreme droughts um, in the summer when we do need the water. And so that timing of the precipitation, even if the total precipitation is the same, the timing shifting can be very detrimental. Okay, so groundwater is a really important part of, of water resources management. Um, the status quo right now in this country and in the world is we have huge amounts of groundwater being pumped out. Very little is monitored to any large degree in terms of who's pumping, how much, what use are they putting it to, what's the quality of that or um, quantity of what's being pumped. There are hundreds of thousands of, of wells um, in the United States. Not all of them are registered um, with the states. Uh, we have uh, tens of thousands of, um, of these wells that may not be maintained or we don't necessarily know what uh, the subsurface looks like where they were drilled. We have lots of sources of pollution, many drillers and consultants, different government agencies and institutions. And to a large degree, this whole thing is not really well managed or even managed at all in some places. Um, most states have some way of tracking or tr uh, trying to institute like a permitting system to drill a well. But the reality is it's very hard to track um, this at all. And when there's not so many people and when groundwater resources aren't being overtaxed, it's kind of fine, right? It's like, we have plenty of the resource, why would we spend all this time and energy trying to manage it? When we are overusing the resource or it becomes scarce, this becomes a massive issue. Um, and part of that is if we look at groundwater development and what the pattern of groundwater development looks like basically throughout time is you have some amount of groundwater and everyone starts using it, right? Unplanned mining. We have this rapid depletion of the groundwater level because everyone's just pumping whatever they want. 
and you get to this point where, okay, wait, it's getting scarce. We need to evaluate our resources, our management options. Do we want a, a world where we regulate this to the point where the resource recovers? Do we want to stabilize where we're at so that the water level kind of doesn't change? Or do we want to actually orderly deplete the groundwater resource? We don't need it forever. We're going to try to deplete the groundwater source in an orderly way. Um, this tends to be what happens. Um, but the problem it, with overdevelopment is we have some things, some problems that can arise that are reversible. Um, so as the water level drops, I have to pump the water up a higher amount. I have to add more energy to pump it out. So by drawing down the water level in the aquifer, I'm increasing the cost of uh, pumping, but also I have to drill wells deeper to get to the water, potentially. Um, and so those are increased cost things where if I stop pumping and let the water level recover, that's a reversible problem, right? Or spring flow reduction. If, if that base flow is feeding some spring and I'm drawing down the water level and it, and it reduces the flow in a spring, if I stop and it recovers, that can, the stream flow can go back up. Um, we have some things that may be reversible, like if the spring, spring flow is reduced, there could be ecosystem stress that might be reversible if that stream flow comes back up, or I might cause a local extinction of a species, right? I might wipe out all the fish in that stream, and then when I bring the spring flow back up, they're not there anymore, right? So that would be a maybe reversible issue. Or irreversible issues like salinization, if you're reducing the groundwater level really low, close to the sea, close to, to the ocean, the ocean water can infiltrate down into the groundwater and salinize it and make it um, salt water. And there's really no way to solve that problem. It's now not usable for most of our uses. Um, or subsidence, right? So if you over overdraw the groundwater and the land subsides, there's no way to get that land to go back up. And when that causes problems with like drainage canals or pumping systems, that can be extremely costly and there's no way to um, repair that well. And so how do we manage the groundwater? Um, one concept is this concept of safe yield. Um, you can think of this, the definition says, amount of the naturally occurring groundwater that can be withdrawn from an aquifer on a sustained basis, economically and legally, without impairing the native groundwater quality or this should be or creating an undesirable effect such as environmental damage right so we're thinking like how much can we really use without causing big problems um, this could be like if you th in some ways some people think of it as you've got some annual average recharge of the groundwater that's how much um, water is coming into it it, you could kind of think of it as how much can I take out that the amount of recharge I get is the amount I could take out while keeping things at a standard level. It's not quite that simple. It's much, it's more complicated than that, but we're considering things like economics, quality, legal rights, other environmental impacts to come up with what is the amount I can pump. And I don't want to pump more than that because then I would cause damage. Okay, so again, to show this maybe graphically is this is the total um, either number of wells or amount of, um, <clears throat> of uh, water that's being pumped. And over time, you, you start going up and up and up and up. You start getting to some stress in either ecosystem stress or stress on the aquifer. And what we want is to get to a level where we get this, we approach this sustainable level of the development without getting into this unstable development area where we get um, conflict and irreversible uh, damage being done. Okay, um, so this idea of artificial recharge, um, I, this is kind of increasingly vital to any groundwater management program in that we, we have some natural state of how much recharge goes into the groundwater and over time, as people are using more and more and more groundwater, uh, we found that we want ways in which we can put more water into the ground than would naturally occur, or that at least would occur given our current state of development. Um, so 
uh, surface infiltration and direct injection are two of those methods. This diagram just shows a bunch of these kind of graphically. So um, this infiltration pond is something where I, I talked about this uh, Rancho Murrieta uh, project I had worked on where the streams going by were diverting water into an infiltration pond in order to uh, to recharge groundwater uh, during the wet season when there's more water available than what we need. That's one technique. Um, others would be like aquifer storage and recovery where we inject water when we have it, withdraw it when we, when we don't. Um, aquifer storage uh, treatment and recovery or aquifer storage transport and recovery where we'd inject it in one well, allow it to flow to a, a second well before we, we withdraw it. Um, bank filtration where this is really just more of a treatment technique where we've got water in the surface and uh, we, we, we pump in wells that are near that river or lake or whatever, allow the water to be filtered through the groundwater before we take it out to use. Um, dune filtration, so again, similar concept here where we're allowing water to percolate through to filter it. Um, percolation tank idea is uh, similar to infiltration pond, but we're building a dam. So we, we allow the water to, to hit to store to be stored and during that storage period um, it's it, it's constantly infiltrating down and being groundwater and then we can we can withdraw that groundwater via well later on um, sand dams are similar kind of concepts to that we've got rainwater harvesting as I mentioned that can be directly used or you could have that rainwater harvested from the roof but instead of running off, go into like a soak pit or a percolation tank that just percolates that water slowly out into the groundwater instead of allowing it to just run off the property. Um, let's see, so a couple other ones, oh yeah, there's the sand dam, um, some other methods, but all of these basically are ways of recharging the groundwater. And here they are just shown more in cartoon fashion of like different places in the watershed where these things might be implemented in order to, again, increase the amount of groundwater recharge or, or otherwise use your groundwater to filter, um, filter our water resources. This final topic of conjunctive use is really just a fancy word for thinking about our water resources systems or ground and surface water as one joint water supply. Um, there's a complex interaction between the two of where you know, surface water recharges groundwater. Groundwater can also serve as base flow to surface water sources. If we draw water out of the groundwater, that can reduce stream flow. Um, if we take the water out of the, the river um, or, or somehow use our surface water resources, we might have less recharge to the groundwater as well. Right, there's a complex interaction between these two things, and really it's one source. It's just, are we accessing it when it's still under the ground? Are we accessing it when it's surface water? Traditionally, these have been thought of as two separate things. Conjunctive use says, hey, these are really kind of the same thing. Let's use them as one resource. Um, but this is kind of complicated and generally involves kind of complex models, um, as well as a lot of like inter-basin, inter-jurisdiction cooperation and communication in order to make it work. Um, again, I go back to the groundwater, the, um, the Rancho Marietta project I was talking about where this required a collaboration between the state, Rancho Marietta, and uh, uh, an irrigation district all working together to sort of share their water rights uh, between each other and across wet and dry years. Um, it required a very complex computer model to see how is this going to work um, and project out what's the benefit of this and therefore is it worth the cost. And there can be a major economic benefit if this is done right, but it's very, very difficult. Um, again, the engineering and the number of assumptions going in is difficult, but what really makes it difficult is the political issues, um, the, the foresight to spend money to to alleviate problems down, down the line, the political and institutional structures to make sure that the water you're banking and the groundwater can be come back to you. Uh, this involves a lot of negotiation with, with state regulators and across 
uh, different water users to make sure everyone feels whole throughout it. This is kind of the future of water supply and water management, especially in places like the American West and other arid areas of the world. Uh, that if we're really going to maximize our benefit of the water resources we have, it requires thinking about these our resources in a much more complex and, and nuanced way than we've tradition, traditionally done. And this requires, again, institutional change, as well as a lot of technology and understanding of what's really going on. So again, this is kind of a grab bag of water, ma water resources management issues. There's also a kind of long video that I want you to watch alongside of this. Um, the quiz is going to address both this lecture and that video. There won't be any homework on water resource management, but the quiz will be just um, cover both. And, and I, I want you to watch that video as well. So uh, that wraps up kind of what I wanted to cover with regards to water resources management.